Hi, everyone. I know it's late in the afternoon. I know I'm the last session before you get out of here. Um, but I'm really excited to talk to you about accelerators, incubators, how to think about them, how to choose the right one. Um, I'm really excited that I get to be the one that gets to talk to you about this today. Uh, I've, I've worked with entrepreneurs uh, for a while now, and I really believe that entrepreneurs and startups are going to be the way that the world keeps innovating and changing. And so, really an honor for me to be here to talk to you all today. Before I begin, though, um, I would love to get a sense of the audience. Um, can you raise your hand if you're a founder? Awesome. That's what I like to see. Can you raise your hand if you want to be a founder? Okay. All right. Well, congratulations. Uh, that is a huge milestone. You have taken the leap, <laughs> and that is the hardest not the hardest, but one of the hardest things to get through um, when you're becoming a founder. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm Danielle, as they said. I'm the managing partner and COO of the Alchemist Accelerator. We are a venture-backed accelerator, um, and we focus on early stage B2B companies. Um, we give a small amount of cash for equity, and the whole point of Alchemist is to accelerate the sales and fundraising process um, along with, oh shoot, um, along with providing access to mentorship and of course the startup community. Um, as you can see, we are backed by some of the top VC funds and strategics in the Valley. Uh, we were created to become the YC for the enterprise. And that is what we've done over the last six years. Um, we've had over 200 companies go through the accelerator. Um, and myself, I've been involved. Um, I was the first full-time hire at Alchemist. I've been doing this for over four years now and worked with a lot of companies, some of which I see in the audience, which is really great to see. And as you can tell from our backgrounds, um, we are Bay Area. We, you know, we are founded by people that went to Cal, Go Bears, for any of you out there. Um, Stanford, uh, Harvard, we, we come with a background and we want to make sure we're bringing the best technical founders um, into Alchemist, building the next gen enterprise companies. But the big question is, why accelerators and incubators? Um, the way that we think about it is time is the lifeblood of startups. You, your most valuable asset right now is your time. You only have so much runway in order to take off. And if you don't take off in time, unfortunately, as most startups do, they die. And so the beauty about Alchemist, or any accelerator, is that we give you the tools and resources to help you move as quickly as possible to get you to take off on, by the time that runway ends. And a couple ways to do that, a couple things that we provide. Um, we teach you how to move quickly. There's no need to recreate the wheel. <laughs> you, there's thousands of startups that have done this before you. Sales, fundraising, customer development. Why do that by yourself? Why make the mistakes if you can go to a place where they can teach you right off the bat what not to do? Because they've got people, they've got other startups in their, um, in their portfolio that are in your industry that will help you not make the same mistakes. And we also say to move cheaply. Oftentimes startups, um, startup founders, think they need to operate like a big business to get off the ground. And honestly, that's gonna be the thing that kills you. Because you cannot spend all the money you have, um, and most of the time you're bootstrapping at first. Um, you can't spend your VC's money or any investor's money that you get on, on everything that you want to do. And so you have to think resourcefully, you have to think creatively. You need to create MVPs and do small tests to validate certain parts of the process uh, in order to test out certain hypotheses. And at Accelerators, we are helping you think in that way so that you don't um, go and spend hundreds of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes on the wrong things. Sometimes you hire too quickly. 
Um, sometimes you build products before you know who you're selling to. We help you think through all of those questions that a lot of startups have at the beginning um, and, and make sure you're, you're spending your time and resources wisely. We are here to help. Um, as I mentioned, accelerators provide consolidated learnings, access to capital, and their networks. So why wouldn't you take advantage of something that exists for that purpose? Um, there, there are different accelerators for different reasons, and we'll go into that in more detail later. But that's a big component of why you should be thinking about um, certain, especially if you're in a niche market, um, going to a place where they focus on a specific um, industry uh, or, or impact, whatever you're focusing on, going to a place where all they're doing is working with companies in your area or the people in their network are focusing on that area is well worth your time. And honestly, we get a lot of companies um, questioning the equity that they have to give up for their startups. And uh, I know this might sound biased, but I promise you this is not a money-making business for a lot of us. We are doing it to help you. We're doing it to help f founders. Um, and oftentimes, you're, you're thinking about the, the dollar signs and the equity that you're giving up on a cap table that honestly doesn't have any real value to it yet. So zero of zero is zero. <laughs> and if you die because you, you've shut down before you're able to do anything, then, then was it really worth you not giving away a little bit of your company in order to take advantage of the resources that are provided to you? So really think through um, what you're gaining and what you're giving up. And of course, make sure the trade-off is, is even. Um, but don't, off, don't see it as, well, I, I, you know, I already, I, it's way too much equity to give up for, for these resources that I could find for free or, or get it myself. You could. Um, you're, it, it may take you longer to do it, but you could. But why? Again, why not take advantage of something that already exists for you? And so going back to determining fit, there are a ton of accelerators out there. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard about the MIT seed, uh, MIT seed Rankings Project, but over the last few years, uh, it, they've made it their mission to try to filter up the best accelerators and incubators um, based off of funding, um, funding rates of their companies and also based off of the satisfaction of their alums and the founders that have gone through. And so that has been a great place to see where the topics, what the top accelerators are. And they analyze hundreds, thousands of them across the US um, and in a certain seed, in a certain stage. So do your homework. Um, you need to talk to other people. You need to talk to other founders, especially ones that are working in your space to see if they've heard of or recommend any. Talk to your advisors. Maybe they're already working with an accelerator that they would recommend. Um, you can also do Google searches. Honestly, a third of our applications come through Google search for people looking for B2B accelerators or enterprise accelerators or top accelerators. Um, so do your research. It's out there. It is going to take some work, but it's, it's going to be worth your time and making sure that if you are going to go to an accelerator, you're going to the right one for the stage that you're in and also the industry that you're in. But a note about accelerators. For the best ones, especially ones that are on this list, they do add a sense of credibility to your startup. We've had a lot of startups actually use the fact that they are in Alchemist as a hook for customers to gain access to our network, for advisors who want to become advisor um, mentors to other startups. And so you can definitely add credibility um, to a lot of constituents that you're trying to pull into your company by joining a well-known accelerator, but don't let that be the only reason you want to join. Um, especially for the top accelerators, of course there's brand recognition that comes with it, but again, at the end of the day, make sure it's serving your end purpose. So you've got your list. Now what do you do? The biggest piece of feedback I can give you is don't actually go talk to the people who run the accelerators. Of course our job is to sell you. Um, 
but the people who are going to be the most honest with you are the ones that have gone through the accelerator. Go talk to the alums. Go talk to people that have worked, that are in your industry, um, that have gone through that program. They are going to let you know if they're honestly, if the accelerator did what they said they could do, and if they provided the right resources in the industry that they're working in. Um, and if you find a lot of companies within a particular vertical or industry within that accelerator, it probably means they've got resources built out for that, for that industry or vertical already. Um, that doesn't mean that they, if they don't have any, that doesn't mean that they can't still serve you, um, but it probably means that they've got enough where you will be able to find the people that you're looking for and, and build that out. Um, for every, so now that you have your list, and you're talking to alums, also go to the websites of all of these accelerators and incubators that you're looking at. Read through their Learn More pages. Um, they're designed so that you can quickly determine fit based off of the criteria. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about you know, applications and what we're looking for, but just know, um, you know all of that is kind of laid out for you so you can quickly go through your list and say, this, this looks like this would be a good fit for me. I probably have a better chance of getting into this one based off of where I am or what I'm building. So remember, um, all the information is provided to you. So now you're ready to apply. You're, you've, you've narrowed it down. What do you need to include? Well, think of an application like a resume. All the accelerators, especially the well-known ones, get hundreds, if not thousands, of applications per year. So what is going to make you stand out? Um, and like I mentioned, for, for Alchemist, we care a lot about the team. And we're an early stage B2B accelerator. So for us, teams are very important. And we're looking for big businesses that, we're, that will warrant the interest of the top VCs. And that's clearly outlined in our FAQ. So you'll be able to see that. But think of it this way, um, as, as my graph will show. Um, Alchemist only accepts 5% of the applications per year. And that's pretty industry standard for the top accelerators like YC and 500 and Techstars. So what is going to set you apart from that top per, the, the, for that 5%? Um, we are, and again, just remember that you know, some accelerators may be more interested in the industry that you're serving or you know, some accelerators are going after social impact. So um, like a resume, whatever you can do to make yourself, of course, we're not saying to lie, um, but whatever you can do to make yourself match the things that they're looking for, try to highlight those parts the most. This isn't really rocket science, but it's things that a lot of founders often overlook. And like I said, teams are everything, especially in the early stages. Um, a lot of the accelerators in the early stages are looking for distinctive, high quality teams. Um, if we do a good job picking the right teams, it really doesn't matter what problem they're solving because we know they're gonna figure it out. Um, so we're not looking at the stage necessarily or the product um, or even the traction, although that differs uh, between accelerators. So make sure, as for yourselves, regardless of whether you apply to an accelerator, that you are finding people to build this startup with um, that are as awesome as you are, uh, to, take on the, uh, to take on the hashtag today. But make sure you're, you're surrounding yourself with other top talent. That is also going to be a strong indication to other investors, regardless of whether you go to an accelerator or not whether this is um, a team that other top talent is going to be excited to join. But a note on traction. If you do have traction and you are applying to an accelerator or an incubator, know that the people evaluating your application are probably going to evaluate it as if they're an investor because they are going, most of them are, will be investing money into your, or into your business. And so, we're going to be looking at your metrics, whether that's MRR or engagement. And we're also going to be looking at your month over month growth to see if it's growing at the right clip. Um, oftentimes, you know, so there's a double edged sword with traction, unfortunately, and every investor will tell you 
It's, if you're at the beginning stages and you don't have any traction, then all we can really go on is the team and the potential and the market idea. But once you have traction, now we gotta start looking at the numbers. Is there enough pipeline here? Is, is, um, is there enough market to capture? Uh, have you plateaued already, right? So there's a lot more questions that come with traction. I'm not saying that to deter you, I'm just saying uh, that's gonna be another strong indication one way or the other if you do have traction. If you have traction and it's growing at the right rate, um, wonderful, and if you don't, then you're gonna need to highlight other aspects of your application to make sure people see that. And just a note for the seed investors. So they're usually looking for 15 to 20K MRR and they wanna see it growing at least 15% month over month. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking of that. Of course, that's for seed funding. Um, and the, the numbers, of course, grow as you go through later stages. But just know, if that's what you're shooting for, you have to try to make the graph look like that. And it should naturally, of course. So going into a little bit on seed rounds, because I know some of you are probably at that stage where you're starting to think about raising from investors. Seed rounds are typically between 750K to about 2 million, of course, give or take on either side. Um, and the caps are usually between six and eight. Uh, some will go as low as three or four. I would say that's, you know, it, it just depends on the seed. But at the end of the day, you're looking at the size of the fund and you need to think about how much ownership that fund needs to take in order for their numbers to make sense on their end. So work out the numbers backwards um, and know that you're gonna have to have enough room in your round for any top tier VC or um, seed fund, micro seeds even, to come in and take probably 20 to 40% um, of the round. And that means you need to be, um, you need to be raising a, an, enough of a round where they can actually fit in along with the other angels and investors that you already have coming in. So think of it that way. Um, um, then that's ranges, and when you're thinking of check sizes, um, and, and when you're going to talk to seed funds, usually the rule of thumb is the fund size divided by 100. So if they have a $400 million fund, then they're probably writing around $4 million checks. And so that's kind of the feedback that we give to, to founders. Um, when you're looking at that, and this, there's a whole other psychology of fundraising that I won't get into, but know that when you're going to talk to investors, um, you need to actually set you need to actually ask for an amount that makes sense within their fund because if you're asking for too little, you actually price yourself out of a check that they, they could typically write because they actually have to invest a certain amount for their LPs. So think of it that way, it's a good rule of thumb. Um, and then if, you know, of course look at their websites, talk to other founders that have, been, that have received investment from any investors that you're talking to. Again, that's gonna let you know um, how it is to work with that investor, um, give you some good insight. So, and this all boils down to grow your network big enough so that you have people to tap into when you have tough questions. Um, just a little, you know, just in thinking, the reason we know so much about this is we actually get 60% of our companies funded. Um, the median funding levels was actually determined by CFB Insights in 2016 and Alchemist was the top performer there. Um, so we're pretty proud of that, uh, considering we're a young accelerator. But we've actually worked with, like I said, over 200 companies, um, and we do a pretty good job of getting them funded from some of the top investors. Um, and so with that, I would love to just open it up to questions. I do want to spend a majority of the time on that. Um, I think we probably have like 20, 25 minutes to do that, um, and we'll take questions from everywhere. But utilize my time um, while I'm here. If you have any questions, honestly, about anything startup related, I can probably address it. But if we can, we'll try to keep it to the topic as much as possible. It's already on, you don't get it. Yes. Um, what do you think are the hottest things in HR tech? We'll turn it on what are the hottest things in HR tech? And things meaning what? Ideas, like areas problem solve. So the HR space is hard. <laughs> I'm sure you're aware, but the HR space is hard. Um, it's not only, it's mainly hard because selling into HR is hard, <laughs> but a lot, of, a lot of industries are like that. 
And there was a period probably a year or two ago that I think the space was heating up fast. Um, you will probably have seen 100 AI chatbots for HR tech um, coming through in different forms. I know we had a bunch of them pitching us. So um, everyone, is, everyone knows that there is a problem within HR tech. Um, you know, and I honestly have not seen a person from HR actually build a solution for HR. I've always seen people who have engaged with HR try to build better solutions and not, you know, falling short a bit. So um, I'm waiting for the person from HR <laughs> to build a solution for themselves that they know people like them would buy. Mm -hmm. uh, question from Twitch. Yes. Uh, Tyrek, with a K at the end, <laughs> asks, it sounds like there's a big emphasis on investing in teams at the early stage. Mm -hmm. Has there been any thought put into how that operationally ends up translating into investing into the same crowd uh, and elite school grads again and again? Uh, how that's not very diverse. How, okay, well, yes, I, the logic is there. If, if everyone keeps investing in the same playground, um, then yeah, we're going, to, we're going to keep investing in the same type of companies. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and that is honestly probably one of the bigger questions now within the VC and investment community, even in accelerators. If we keep looking at um, you know, even in the Bay Area, the top schools, Berkeley and, and Stanford, um, then yeah, we're, we're gonna start pick, st we're gonna continue to pick the same types of people. Um, but I will make a note that there is a lot of effort on the diversity side from, you know, accelerators, incubators, even on the investment side. At Alchemist, we're, we're doing 40% um, of our classes are international. Um, and actually two of my startups that I see are actually from, not from the Bay Area. Um, so we're making a lot of efforts to, you know, to expose all the other places around the world um, to Silicon Valley and, and give, you know, help them come here. I've actually been more blown away by the ideas that I've heard um, from companies overseas than, than a lot of the ones that I hear here because they've had to be more resourceful in their own countries and thinking through solutions. Um, so honestly, love those types of ideas. Uh, they're, they're, hard, they're hard problems that need solutions and they're applying tech to them, so a lot of smart people. Um, how do we solve that? We just, we just need to start looking outward and not inward. Um, that's easier said than done, though. Yes? So kind of related to that question, mm -hmm. Um, good question. So we love young teams because of the energy that you bring, um, but you oftentimes don't bring along the um, the experience uh, that that comes from experiencing the problem firsthand like a lot of other founders do. And that's going to give a lot of other founders the leg up. But what you can do is surround yourself with advisors, mentors, people that um, have experienced the problem firsthand and show that you are developing an expertise in an area that you, you, you feel so passionately that you need to, to, to understand everything, right? Um, and it also shows that you're able to attract other experts um, to your team, maybe not formally, but it shows that again, um, people who have seen this problem enough believe in you uh, to think that you're building a solution that they, they would care about. So I would say that's probably the best, the best way to do it. Um, and if possible, try to experience the problem as much as you can. Um, and if that means embedding yourself in the problem, go do it. Uh, but that's, that comes down to hustling. Uh, question from Starblam. <laughs> How many VCs would you expect to typically approach and follow up? What's the best indicator of a match? It's like, what's that funnel look like? Um, so you are probably, well, so for fundraising, expect 90 days. Of, of fundraising, of intense fundraising, and by that I mean you're meeting with, you're having at a minimum 12 meetings a week, 
um, for three months. So do that math, and that is going to usually lead to your $2 million round. Um, it, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of research, because it's, you're not only meeting with anyone that's interested, but you're also, um, you're also f going after the ones that are most relevant to you, and then reaching out, and you're also reaching out to angels versus institutions versus strategic. So, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, fundraising is not easy. Some people really enjoy it, but that's probably the minority of people. Everyone else really hates it. Yes. Hi, my name is Ethan Berry, and I, um, I've had a, a lot of startup experience working with uh, some very spectacular founders, uh, Tom Pru, Scott Cook, Eric Dunn, um, Jeff Braun, Will Wright, um, yeah, Will Wright. Um, but as we all know, there's a diversity and inclusion issue with Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that, but how do you uh, proactively go about bringing in startups that are from African Americans or Hispanics to fill that diversity gap? Um, I'm here. I'm, I'm a woman in a leadership position that is running a small company and I believe that is probably the first step in getting more visibility. Um, we exist. <laughs> um, and, and so do a lot of people of color and minorities. They are running companies. Um, but unfortunately, they're not, they're not bringing enough attention to themselves to let everyone know that they exist, right? And they exist, and we, we, have some awesome, we have some awesome companies um, that fit that bill. And I wish more people knew about them. And so if you know someone that is, please encourage them to go and talk and get out there and let people know that, yes, it's possible. It's harder, definitely, but it is possible. Um, and and they, should, they should not let anything stop them from going after what they want. Um, and so we are trying to get our founders that fit that to go out and give talks and let people know that they exist, that they can do it too. Um, and I'm hoping, and I, this is actually my first talk to the public because um, I think it's enough of an issue where we need to, we need to come out and, and show that there are people in leadership roles, there's people out there trying to support startups, um, and they should not be afraid to, to apply to, to get out there. Uh, my boy Wheezy Z would like to know, um, how can startups compete against the big four for top tech talent? Good question. When you're hiring, especially your first couple of hires, they, they are going to be hired based off of the mission of the company, and they have to be hired based off of the mission. One, you won't be able to compete on, on money. You don't have it. Um, so what are the other things that you can bring that they won't get at the other places? Um, they're going to have the, they're going to have a major stake in a company. They're going to have the responsibility and ownership that, that they won't be able to get on a large team. They're going to be one, the ones making the decision, the one that's going to have the largest impact on the direction of the business. Um, and so really highlighting that, of course, um, you know, Getting accepted into a strong accelerator shows that there's validation. That's also helpful. Getting funded by some top tier um, investors or in institutions or VCs, um, that's also helpful. So it's a way to show validation that people also believe in you. That lowers the risk for them to join. Um, what you have to realize and remember is that when you jumped off the cliff to start, the found <laughs> to start your company, um, that, that is, that is a, a rare moment that happens. Um, and thinking that everyone else you bring with you after that point, aside from your co-founders, um, you can't expect that. They are all leaving very cushy jobs with uh, health benefits and, and lots of money and 401ks and all these things. And so you are competing with a lot. Um, but you have to sell them on, on the impact, on the mission, on the idea of what you're building. Um, because when you go to any of the top other companies, um, you're just going to be a number. 
You're just going to be one of hundreds, thousands. Um, and yeah, you may have some, some opportunity to build things, but you won't own it. Office dogs go a long way. <laughs> one more question. Um, hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, yeah. My name is Sandeep. I'm a first time uh, founder. Awesome. Uh, uh, question is, on Accelerator, you kind of touched upon, you know, idea stage. You guys help with the product market fit, sales, and so. Is there a point where it's, you know, accelerators are not, you know, as useful, or, you know, what's good, your take on that? Good question. Um, we've actually had, we've actually had some serial entrepreneurs come through Alchemist. We've had later stage companies actually come through Alchemist and use us as a fundraising vehicle. I think at that stage, you are honestly thinking, what is, you know, I think you should always think about this, but what, what am, um, what the big, the most bang for your buck, basically, right? So at a certain stage, um, where are you lacking? And by giving up a certain portion, and of course the economics are usually discounted for later stage companies, um, at least at Alchemist they are, um, or I should say we can talk about it, but um, know that for the right teams, a lot of accelerators are, will, are willing to stretch the criteria to make sure that you can become part of their network and their community. Um, because at the end of the day, especially in the early stages, the community is everything. And adding, adding a, the right person to that community can make all the difference. And so I think that's also the benefit of joining at a later stage too, because you're also tapping into this this huge network of people. Um, you're, accelerating, you're accelerating usually the fundraising process. For a lot of international companies, I've actually seen them come through um, and treat sales in the US for the first time like they were an early stage company. Um, and so using a platform like Alchemist helps them quickly see the differences while using the process that they've already created. And, and we've already have a large, um, large group of customers that they can get feedback from and, and work from there. So at the end of the day, I think, you know, they're just accelerating the growth. Um, yeah. Dr. Hero would like to know, you love the names, right? I it's know, great. yeah, it's great. <laughs> it adds so much color and like character to it. So Dr. Hero's question is, what types of startups would you advise to avoid VCs and accelerators? What? Other than bad ideas. <laughs> yeah, yes. I was like, um, <laughs> What type, so, sorry, rephrase that question. So are there types of startups who should avoid, uh, that they don't need to do that, they can bootstrap it on their own, they don't need the help from the VCs and accelerators? Um, well, I'm gonna be biased in my answer here and go back to my point that you could do that, every startup could do that. And of course, um, you know, if you are a serial entrepreneur and you think you you have been through it all and you've learned it all and you know exactly what to do the next time around, then by all means. Um, but every time I talk to a startup founder, even if this is their third, fourth company, they always come back and tell me, God, I wish I had known that the first time. <laughs> and so um, we, just, we just come with a lot of learnings that, um, you know, just because you've done something once and it proved successful doesn't mean it was the best way to do it. And I think what we provide is just the best way to do it based off of all the learnings that we've had. We've already kind of built a process out. So. <laughs> yeah, and well, no, I don't know about that. It's a hard business. I have this, con it's a different conversation. But if you're thinking of starting an accelerator, please come talk to me first. I will talk you out of it. <laughs> um, but it is, a, it, it is a really rewarding job. So but there's other ways to be rewarding with startups. <laughs> we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, so first. Yes. 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 So um, have you worked with any companies that go on to do like a TGE in a few months? Sorry, do what? Uh, TGE or an ICO. Um, we've had a couple of companies um, do ICOs uh, or, or in the process of raising their ICOs this year. Yes. That's the short answer. <laughs> uh, we'll do one Twitch one and one in audience. Okay. Uh, so, oh God, to read these. The Dillian, the Dillian Reyna <laughs> wants to know, what are some ways that pre-revenue startups can validate themselves to investors and accelerators? Validate themselves. Um, this is a great question, actually, because there are so many things that 
companies can do without money. And I think that goes back to my MVP slide. Um, you need to learn to be resourceful. Assume you have nothing. Assume you have no money, which a lot of you don't. So just assume that there's nothing to work with other than your wit <laughs> and, and the people that you have around you. So if you operate in that way and assume that there's no money coming in from investors, because a lot of people like to think that, oh, I just need to raise money, and once I get the money, then that solves all my problems. Well, we keep operating in that way. We're going to raise a lot, a lot of money without having any sort of validation. And so think of it this way. What are the smallest possible tests that you can run to validate certain hypotheses? And whether that means, um, you know, does that mean running uh, a survey in a particular type of environment, does that actually mean going door to door or you know, printing flyers? I don't know, think back to high school. Think super low budget creative. Um, and that's, those are the things that VCs actually attribute a lot to because if you're able to do all that work and still get certain validations, um, then it's proving that you will stop at nothing to make sure that this business succeeds. And that is what we call hustle. Um, a lot of founders think they have it. I, I see it in a very small majority of founders, actually. But those are the ones that I like to see the most and work with the most. Yes? Thank you. Uh, my name is Raghu Ebla, co-founder of Panamian. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, one experience uh, I found is uh, noticed in terms of uh, corporate partners, uh, particular accelerator brings in is uh, in a particular domain which we might work or benefit from them how much we want to work with them or how much we don't want to work with them and maybe that that industry has four other kind of um, mm, companies which we will might we might be better positioned to partner with but not the one which the accelerator is in hands so th how does that often work in, in, in at, the, at your accelerator in particular, um, what do what what do you mean by partner? Uh, typically, accelerators who t team up with a lot of cor corporate partners who are mm -hmm. established players in the mm -hmm. industry, and and uh, sometimes we do see benefits in partnering with them as startup to sort of build an ecosystem or thing. Yeah. And often we may not want to work with. No, that, them that's that's very fair. Um, there are definitely companies building um, disruptions to corporates that uh, often support these accelerators. And we've definitely had companies, and they come to me and they're like, I don't want them knowing that I exist. Totally fine. But when they want to know that they exist, they're in a position, um, they're in a better position to then go and talk to them. Of course, it comes later, but totally fine. We don't force any, and I don't imagine, any, well, maybe certain, but I don't imagine many accelerators or incubators force their companies to talk to anyone they don't want to. It's not in the company's best interest. Um, but um, it's, it's also good to get, have a neutral conversation with those types of people to understand their thinking. And sometimes they'll, things will slip about how they're thinking about their five-year vision to give you a good idea of how you should be thinking about the market as you build your company too. Um, you'll either be building it in a disruptive way, um, enough, disruptive enough where you'll get their attention and they'll probably want to acquire you, um, or you'll be building it in a way where it's not even on their radar. So, any burners? Any unicorns online? I'm, I, I didn't hear that name come up at all. <laughs> you mean that they refer to themselves as unicorns? <laughs> yeah, no, or? no, I, we had Dr. Hero, I, Dr. you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there are thousands of people on there having discussion currently. Um, <laughs> we're good online, I, okay. think, uh, I think that's plenty. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so please, round of applause, Danielle, right. thank you very thank much. You.